Hey everybody, welcome back to Northern Land Place of Binding of Isaac Afterworth Plus. It's been almost 15 wins. 14's a nice milestone, that's two weeks of wins. We get Samson. Samson, the the book is already written on Samson, you know? Y1R6H1TA. The most important thing, if possible. Whoa, what the... You see the... He, he shot like a... It was a trick shot. He defied the laws of physics. Anyway, we didn't get hit, so we can stop being dramatic. Basically, mostly we want to get the uh, IV bag, would be ideal. Um, it's, it's not the best item in the game, even for Samson, but it's one of the ones that we have the, uh, the easiest ability to get. Sorry, I'm just getting my ergonomics set up here, ready to go. It is a Sunday. Happy Sunday, everybody. Ah, uh, we're okay. We're okay. It being Sunday means that yesterday was my day off. What did I do? I, uh, you know, not that much. Might as well walk into this one more time. Um, still, you know, like last weekend was PAX. So you're busy. You're doing a lot of, you know, walking around. I did a lot of walking around yesterday, but it, it was at a much more leisurely pace, you know? A little bit more relaxed. The most anecdote rich thing I did yesterday was, uh... I watched... X-Men 3, The Last Stand on TV. And you're gonna say, NL, I love you, But how are you gonna spin 8 minutes of dialogue out of 2006's X-Men 3, The Last Stand? Well, let me tell you. First off, I have seen The Last Stand before. I saw it on his opening weekend in theaters in 2006. 2006? <laughs> What's wrong with my brain right now? Still a little early here, still waking up. Um, and the best part of waking up is anecdotes in Isaac. Kinda works. Dude, it's a very, very convenient time to get there's options. Um, so, I, well, I mean, I saw it opening weekend, and if you're a little bit, like, maybe you didn't grow up during that period, maybe you're not contemporaneous with the X-Men films originally coming out, it, it, there's, it's unfair, you know? You get, like, a hindsight bias, you know? Why would you go see that in theaters? Wow, you really saw The Matrix 2 in theaters? You must be some kind of idiot. Don't you know that movie's bad? Well, I didn't. The day it came out... You know, it was the sequel to one of the most, uh... Beloved, uh, original action movies ever made. And then when you watch it, you're like, what the heck are these, uh... What the heck are these weird twins doing here? What are, I don't I don't get it. Anyway, hold on. I wanna get money. Okay, that's not gonna happen. Um, well, we don't need to worry about getting, uh... An arcade on our next floor. Mostly because there's no way we can do it. But anyway... Is the same with X3, okay? So, like, X1, well, dude, X-Men, decent movie. I remember it came out when I was in, like, sixth grade. It was one of the hottest movies of that summer. People were like, I did not believe they would ever be able to translate all the powers of the X-Men on the film. Has it aged well? Well, eh, yes and no. It has that, that awful line in it that everybody loves to quote. You know what happens to a toad that's struck by lightning? What? The same thing that happens to everything else. It's not a good line. And, you know, it, it's... It's from a different era of superhero movies, but it's got a little bit of charm to it as well. Then, the sequel, X2. Still to this day, one of the best superhero movies, in my opinion. Brian Cox as Colonel William Stryker. A, a, a truly uh, menacing atmosphere once they get to the site of the the project x experiments is really good so of course x3 comes out is the is the final movie in the x-men franchise with this cast or so we thought x men so weird because like you know you in well I, I, i'm trying to think of a good metaphor but like it's like they rebooted the... Well, actually, you know what? James Bond is a great example, because Judy Dench was like... She was M. And then, like... You know, Pierce Brosnan was like, I'm not James Bond anymore. So we were like, who's M gonna be? 
It's Judy Dench. It's it's like the, the role she was born to play somehow. I don't necessarily get it, but you know, I'm not gonna deny that. You know, it worked. Casino Royale, Skyfall, etc., etc. Anyway, we, so all the movies have Hugh Jackman, but sometimes, uh, you know, the Wolverine, or not Wolverine, sometimes Professor X is played by uh, the guy from Split whose name I forget temporarily, James something, and then uh, Magneto is either, uh, you know, Michael Fassbender or Ian McKellen, etc., etc. Anyway. You can see why I'd be excited. You know, you're coming off a, a smash hit, both critically and commercially. Then X3 was just kind of pure garbage. There's so many... While watching that movie, dude, I was like... Movies... And that's not to say there's not still bad movies. But on the whole, the quality of superhero movies has improved so much. Like, here's a, I'm gonna spoil a little bit of X3 for you. It came out 13 years ago. If you haven't seen it now, honestly, consider yourself... Like, I'm doing you a favor, is what I'm trying to say. Um, so Mystique is like Magneto's right-hand woman for the entire left hand, right? Which one's the closest one? Anyway. You know, she's always shape-shifting into people and, you know, she's impersonating senators to, uh, you know, expand mutants' reach in politics and stuff like that. She's been an incredible asset, but the, the crux of uh, X3 is that a, a cure to mutantness has been invented. So they turn it into these weird darts that you can shoot out of a gun. Um, to try to like, you know, cleanse all the mutants of their mutant powers. But then, uh, you know, someone goes to shoot Magneto with one of the anti-mutant darts. And uh, Mystique jumps in front of the bullet, because that's just the kind of lady that Rebecca Romaine Stamos is, right? And then, you know, it's very sad. She loses her shape-shifting powers, um, because she gets hit by the dart. And then she's just lying there on the ground, and she's going like, Eric! Eric! And then Magneto, w played with deafness, by the way, is an adroit performance from Ian McKellen with not much to work with. But he says, sorry, my dear. And then turns to the other guy and goes, she's not one of us anymore. And you're like, dude, you couldn't just find her like a, like a role within the organization. She's clearly still an ally of the mutant cause. You know, she's, she's just gone through this traumatic event. And you know, you're basically, I don't know, there's always like a weird kind of romantic tension between them as well. Like professional respect, but also they might be doing it even though he's 70 and she was like 35. Not that there's anything wrong with that, I'm just saying Magneto's also operating from a position of power, so it, it strikes me as a little bit scummy, but anyway. Um, I just, uh, you know, that's where I kind of looked at, at the movie and I was like... Really? Like, you couldn't have given us some more... I get it, Magneto's a bad guy. You couldn't have given us some more human interaction there, though. I'm not saying, you know, she should have been appointed your Secretary of Defense or whatever. I'm just saying, like... You literally just had... Magneto abandon Mystique. She gets hit by a dart. Not like, hey, hold her at the base, maybe we'll come up with the cure or something. Anyway, the point is... Um... Is it in the the movie? It makes a theme out of that. Like I don't know if there was like contract negotiations or if like the better talent involved kind of saw the writing on the wall. But like, you know, Cyclops gets murked like five seconds into the movie. He goes to see Jean Grey, who is not Jean Grey. She's Phoenix now, and then uh, she just vaporizes him. And then, you know, it, there's a recurring theme. Uh, Professor Charles Xavier goes to visit uh, Phoenix, and then she vaporizes him. Like it's pretty, she, he literally explodes, which makes it even funnier. Cause like th this is back in the days when you know, I'm not saying this movie was well liked, just to be clear. But you know, y there were lower standards for superhero movies. Like, like Charles explodes. If you watch the scene from the movie, it's like they, it was like a Fist of the North Star sort of situation. You know. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know what he says. It's, you're already dead, but anyway. Then at the end of the movie, in the post credit sequence, like, Charles's wife 
is is like administering care to somebody in a hospital and then he goes like Mora and then she's like Charles and then goes dunk 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 and you're like he what do you mean he's alive he exploded I get it like okay he's become such a psychic powerful energy he's just He's no longer Professor Charles Xavier. He exists like as a as an otherworldly force within the universe or something. But you can't just drop that in the post. Like it's one of those things that's so monumental. When you drop it in a post credit scene like that, it feels cheap. You know, you got you owe the people a little bit more of an explanation than that. I don't know, man. I, I guess I'll take the luck upgrade here. We probably got enough HP. There's, there's more. It's, it's weird. Kelsey Grammer, you know, Frasier, he's in it. He plays Beast, who mostly just sits in the Oval Office advising the president and all the time. It's very weird. It's, it's just a strange movie. The, the other moment that got me, and you're like, shut up about this now. I told you I could get seven minutes out of this, no problem. I've, I've got ten minutes more coming, by the way. Is that, you know... It's from that era, and that era might still exist to some extent, where because there's, you know, one character is a man and one character is a woman, they're gonna fall in love. Uh, so, you know, Jean Grey, she's the phoenix, and then Wolverine. He's had, like, in the first two movies, he's had, like, a crush on her. I don't know if in the comics it's more pronounced, but in the movies, I don't know if they've necessarily earned the, the Jean Grey, Wolverine, Cyclops love triangle. Like, Cyclops and Jean Grey are dating, and then Wolverine's just kind of like, he's there to throw a little bit of sandpaper into it. But in the third movie, she's like, she's Phoenix. And then, you know, she's flaying Wolverine's skin, but his healing factor is bringing it back. And then she's like, you would die for them. She means the human beings. Because um, every X-Men movie is about the same conflict. Um, even though I like a lot of them. You can't deny it. Uh... You would die for them. And then Hugh Jackman, again, doing his best, goes, No. Jane. I don't know why I'm... I, I just think it'd be funny if he kept his Australian accent for some reason. Crikey. Little, little offensive, but that's okay. I'd die for you. And then her eyes get the non-Phoenix thing. She's back to being Fam K. Jansen, a.k.a. Xenia on top from uh, GoldenEye. Another great James Bond movie. Judy Dench, I don't I can't remember if she's in that one. I think maybe. She's one of those actresses who's been old since I was born. So it's definitely possible. And anyway, she goes, Kill me. Logan, kill me. And then You know, Logan's like, alrighty. And then uh she goes, I love you. And I'm like, really? But you didn't even, like, I don't know if you had more than one real conversation over the course of three movies in the last half decade. What do you mean? Yeah, you always had, like, a little bit of a physical attraction, but what do you mean you love each other? You haven't even, you don't even know each other. You just work together. You're co-workers. That's a weird admission. I guess it's a dramatic moment. You know, it's like in The Nanny when Fran Drescher and... With Mr. Darcy are on the airplane and then it goes down and they, you know, embrace. But anyway, I remember a lot of this movie, to be honest now, because I saw it in the in the summer uh, that I was graduating from high school, you know? It was the era of, uh, you know, I have a little bit of a late birthday, so I only got my driver's license. I'm trying to think now. I could only drive without another licensed driver in the car. For like the last six or seven months of my high school career. And because I lived in the suburbs, that's really where, you know, you got to start being a little bit more independent. So, you know, I saw a lot of movies with my friends that summer. I remember within the same like three month period, I saw X-Men The Last Stand, uh, Nacho Libre, and Talladega Nights The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. And... You could not imagine my my surprise and the feeling of betrayal I had as a 17-year-old kid when all three of them turned out to be utter trash. <laughs> I know that... Look, 
I think it just says something that the one of those that's remembered the most fondly by far is Talladega Nights, which I have seen in the intervening years since. I, I don't mind Will Ferrell on the whole, but I'm going to give you a little, a little Will Ferrell shorthand. If you don't like a Will Ferrell movie when you're 17, you're not going to like it when you're 28. That's my experience. Unless it's like, you know, maybe Stranger Than Fiction, but I liked that movie when I saw it when I was like 18. It was a great movie. Anyway. Nacho Libre just kind of like... I, I get it. You know, I like Jack Black a lot as well. Fellow YouTuber. Uh, yeah, I guess we'll take Super Bandage. I wouldn't mind some, like, raw damage increase. We'll go back to our, uh... Blood Bank to, uh, yeah, to try to make it happen. But, uh, you know, Nacho Libre is just kind of like... It's got funny parts, but it's also kind of boring. Thank you. And then X-Men The Last End is just like, it's the ultimate betrayal. It's just really bad. It's got that, you know... It, I mean, it's so weird. That, that movie is like, it has a lot of actors and actresses who went on to do much more important stuff. Like, Ellen Page is in that movie. I can't remember who she plays, but it's the, it's the mutant that can like, you know, phase through matter. Pretty powerful, right? She's fighting the Juggernaut, and she like sinks his bottom half into the floor. And Vinny Jones is the Juggernaut. Goes, "Who hey, you think I am? I'm the Juggernaut." And then he says the B word, and man, somebody at the at the studio actually like watched that and went, "Yeah, that's that's what I want in my movie." More power to you, I suppose. Um. Anyway. Then I watched uh, the first 45 minutes of X-Men Origins Wolverine, because I guess it was like, I guess the rights to the X-Men franchise were half off because Dark Phoenix uh, tanked. And uh, I was like, ooh, so it could be worse. I don't know. <laughs> would I rather, would I rather, w like, it's not quite the same, but X-Men The Last Stand to me is like, what if you waited, uh, you know, you were a big fan of the Marvel movies and then Endgame came out and it was actually like an unmitigated disaster. I'm gonna stop you from tipping your hand, by the way, if you're like, it was. You can't be taken seriously. It's not that I don't allow room for dissent. If you don't like Endgame, that's fine, but if you're like, it's a travesty. That's too far. It's like people who are like, I, you know, Saving Private Ryan is the worst movie I've ever seen. Okay, maybe it's not the, you know, I mean, I think it's a great movie. But, you know, you by have, by virtue of having a ridiculous opinion, you're going to be treated ridiculously. You know, it's, if you're like, I don't like it as much as everybody else, that's fine. But if you're like, it's the worst thing I've ever seen. See more things, dude. This sounds like it's the only thing you've ever seen. Ah, uh, but Spielberg is pro so prosaic. When will he make a film with the pathos of Kimi no Nawa? Oh, you know it by your name. Anyway. Somebody's got to be the butt of that joke. I apologize. I like, I mean, I love Kimi no Nawa. I cry like a baby every time I watch it. I even call it Kimi no Nawa, uh, you know, unironically. I actually think we would like uh, Leech here. Brian? Number two for the New York Rangers, one of the best, probably one of the top 20 defensemen in NHL history. You know, I mean, you got your you got your Bobby Orr's, you got your Nicholas Lidstrom's, you got your Doug Harvey's. After you get past that, you know, you're probably looking at, I don't know, maybe like Ray Bork. Then you start to, I mean, it depends how you consider Paul Coffey, I mean... Not really the best uh, defensive defenseman of all time, but, you know, great stats. But are those stats, you know, padded by virtue of playing with some of the greatest players of all time on some of the most stacked teams ever? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, but you can't really take that away from him, I think. Anyway, where am I going with this? I forgot. And then after that, uh, obviously, is Ed Jovanovsky and uh, Benjamin Hutton. Curious case of Benjamin Hutton. It's weird to say, but like, you know, I, I look back fondly on that period of the, uh, like that summer between uh, 12th grade and university, mostly for the movies. I, I mean, I had like great times apart from that as well. But it was also just like, 
It was a different era. Nowadays, when I go to the movie theater, most of the time, I kind of know how I'm going to feel about a movie. You know what I mean? Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, with all the... And, and I'm, it's better now. I end up seeing a lot less garbage. But... Uh, hold on, I just want to focus for a second here. Back then, you, you know... Rotten Tomatoes existed. I'm not sure if Metacritic existed at that point. But sometimes he would just be like, you know, Jack Black with a Spanish accent. How could it be bad? The critics must be wrong. Then I go see it and I, you know, it's a total wild card. You're like, I don't know how I feel about this movie. Until it's over. And then you're like, ah, I kind of thought it'd be fun. He didn't even do, he didn't even sing a song in his funny Tenacious D voice. No stars. Nowadays, I'm like, you know, you kind of know going in. Like, let's be honest. I knew going into Aladdin that I wasn't going to leave the theater singing the songs from Aladdin. That I, I did that one for, for husband points. Now, The Lion King. I was like, that is going to bring me to tears. And then I was, you know, not really. Uh, forget Boss Rush. We don't care. But for the most part, when I go see a movie, I'm like, you know. I've already pre-screened it. Just in the sense that, you know, I've, I've, I've looked at reviews and stuff like that, and most of the time I don't differ from them that much. It was different back then. You go see a movie, you don't know if it's gonna be uh, up your alley or not. Saw Die Another Day in theaters in ninth grade. I thought it was probably... If you had asked me right after the movie, I would have been like, that's the best James Bond movie ever made. It is now considered by, like, probably the majority of people to be by far the worst James Bond movie ever made. It's really bad. But at the time, I was like, best James Bond movie ever. At the time, I had also seen, like, three James Bond movies. But as a kid, you have a lot of recency bias, to be fair. If you like something, whatever you just saw was the coolest thing you've ever seen. You guys ever see uh, the uh, horror movie where the Tooth Fairy is the villain called Darkness Falls? Uh, it's extremely horrible. It makes no sense. It, like, it's incoherent. But I saw it at uh, one of my friend's, like, 13th birthday parties. She was an interesting character. It's not her fault. Her parents would not let her watch PG-13 movies until she was 13 years old. So, you know, we're talking about... This is... Uh, not the dawn of the internet age, but, you know, the other 13-year-olds there seen some messed up stuff <laughs> online. On websites that have probably since been removed, you know, by, like, government subpoenas and stuff like that. But back then, you know, you're like 12 years old, you're like, I don't know. Take me to peoplesheadsexploding.com. But anyway, we saw the movie. Probably has, like, an 8%. Uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, it might actually be lower. I'm gonna check that right now. But people were like, the kids I saw it with were like, oh yeah, it's the greatest movie of all time. Darkness Falls. It's got a 5 on IMDb and a 9% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's pretty bad. We will take PhD. Then again, that's not really a fair comparison. Because, like, you know, when you're a kid. You, you, you like different stuff from movies, you know? That's why I like, and I'm not being facetious here at all. I actually think that, sure, making a really mature adult movie is a, not an adult movie. Who calls them that anymore? You know what I mean. A movie for adults. In the daytime. On a weekday. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, it takes talent. Like, I, I, wouldn't say I didn't like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but it's it's a it's a very adult film, and it's gonna it's still taking time to digest, you know, and and think about how I actually feel about the movie in general. Um, that takes a lot of talent. It takes a lot of craftsmanship. Don't get me wrong, but I also think like you know making a, a movie that kids and adults can both enjoy is is really tough. Cause like if you're watching this right now. I'm just here to tell you, you're an adult. In in reputation or like 
you know, legally speaking. No seven-year-old kid is like, oh, I want to listen to this grandpa. Because kids always think, like, if you're, you know, you're old. You're probably, like, 25. You got it all figured out. Anyway. He's talking about a movie that came out when I was, like, negative eight years old. You know? It just seems... I've seen this stuff kids watch on YouTube. Baby shark doo 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 doo. Baby shark doo doo. And then, like, uh... You know, making a bunch of slime and stuff like that. I'm not like that, you know? I'm not saying you couldn't watch these with your kid, but your kid, you know, depending on their age. You know, if your kid's 30, they might enjoy it. <laughs> if your kid's like 13, they're gonna be bored to sin. I wanna watch Tifu, Which is, you know, not really... I mean, that's punching up. You might think that's punching down, but... You know, you guys making like... 250 grand a day playing Fortnite, so I think that's that's the definition of punching up. Anyway, help. Ah. Regardless, that's why I like when I see like Toy Story 4 was such a good example. I'm an adult. Had a great time watching that movie, and not because of nostalgia. It wasn't like oh Buzz, I haven't seen you on the silver screen in a decade. It was just like it's a good movie. But then you see trailers for like that Smurfs, not Smurfs, that Trolls movie, which is just there's a troll Thanos who wants to capture the six infinity guitar strings and then eliminate all genres of music but rock. I'm like, that's a movie that's just for kids. Not saying it doesn't have a place in the world as well, but when a, when a show or a, a movie is is truly enjoyable by all audiences. It's extremely well done. I got a lot of respect for that. I don't have a lot of respect for that room, though. Like, to be honest, this run is very, very good. Our stats speak for themselves. Magic Mush is doing a lot of the heavy lifting, and we just got it, but still. But it's kind of like, it's a little boring. Like, not. I hope you're having a good time listening to me rant about the movies of my youth. But, uh... You know, we, uh, mostly have just gotten stat increases. Which is actually, ironically, I suppose, what I want most of the time. Not an XL floor. I'm always complaining about not getting the stat increases, so I don't want to sound too negative. I'm willing to give this a shot. You know, we should probably use IV bag to do it, I guess, but... Explosive diarrhea. That's in PhD. Explosive diarrhea. Yeah, PhD. Pretty heckin' dangerous for a for a pharmaceutical device. I guess a pill is it's a device. You know? It's a great get. Thank you so much. Two of hearts. It's not a great get, but thank you nonetheless. I got a lot of respect for that kind of art. Kids are just, they're less discerning critics most of the time. Which is ironic in some sense, because kids are also like, they're they are harsh with their feedback, right? Like they don't, uh, I think we definitely want this. Kids don't have a filter. But yet, <laughs> they're hypocrites. Because they'll like any drivel you throw in front of them as long as it has a talking animal. I mean, make up your mind. <laughs> if you're going to be out there like, you know, why are you so ugly? You know, you can't, that puts you in a position of, of seeming like you have high standards. And then you're like, oh, my favorite movie? It's uh, <laughs> Angry Birds. Come on. You know, at least like... It doesn't have to be anything too cerebral. It could just be like a Fellini film or something like that, but make up your mind. It hurts. Tell me. Um, man, I was also reminded how miserable it is to watch movies on TV. I know that, like, everyone... <laughs> I get made fun of uh, by the other people on the NLSS, and I think in this case, for the one, this is the unique exception of the rule, is actually highly deserved. 
why on earth am I watching movies on TV when, first off, we have the movie channels. Secondly, I have Amazon Prime, I have Netflix, uh, you know, if I wanted to, for a couple of bucks, I could buy basically any movie ever made on Google Play Video or, you know, iTunes rentals and etc, etc. Why are you watching a movie on TV with advertisements? And, you know, every 10 or 12 minutes, you got to watch two minutes of ads for Procter & Gamble and Johnson & Johnson products or Unilever. Um, I don't... Here's the thing. Why... Why do I watch a movie on TV sometimes over a movie of my choice? Because taking the choice out of the equation is actually pretty helpful. I think. I, I truly... You know, I've talked about that before. But... Uh, you know, for me, it's like, you know, if you got an infinite library of movies, I'm going to spend 45 minutes trying to figure out what the perfect thing to watch is. If you've only got access to, like, the four things that are on TV, it makes the decision a little bit easier. Secondarily, why don't I watch on the movie channels then, where they only play, like, four things? Well, because a lot of those movies are good but not great. I don't want to watch a good but not great movie if instead I have the opportunity to watch a movie that's pretty terrible. It's just more enjoyable. So like, sometimes people... I, I'm not unique in this. Lots of people love watching bad movies. Um, and, you know, X-Men The Last Stand is no exception. Uh, but it's like sometimes I'll play a game on, uh, on like our Sunday streams. And people will be like, why are you playing this bad game? When you could be playing The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. And I'm like, that's because The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is good. I don't want to... What, what am I going to say about a good game? Wow, this game is, is really good. It's really got me hooked. I mean, there's a place for that, you know? I've played great games on the stream. I've had a good time. But I, I mostly want something where I can also insert myself into the story a little bit, you know? And I don't know if I can do that. I'm not saying we won't play Breath of the Wild at some point. I mean, we're in the nintendo sans here. But... Right now, I'm like, I would much rather play stuff that has high riffing potential. Because it lets me feel smarter than the people who made the game, despite everybody involved being, I don't know, about a hundred times more talented than I am. Which goes for just about any form of professional media. It's a bad time to take a little damage, but it's not that big of a deal. Let's just get our HP and move on. Anybody can make a good game entertaining. The work is done for you. It takes craftsmanship to make a bad game entertaining. It's the Mystery Science Theater 3000 effect, you know? Like, you would never watch half of the... You'd never watch 95% of the movies on Mystery Science Theater 3000. Were it not for the fact that there were, you know professional comedians making jokes over top of it. I'm just, I'm, I'm scouting my brain here. To see how I feel. Oh. That was extremely good. Like, I'm seeing if I have confidence that we can't lose this run. Because it is a weird one. Like, we... What did we even take for deals with the devil? We didn't even... Like, the uh, Lord of the Pit wasn't even a deal with the devil item. It was from the Fallen. Missing page two is from a demon judgment. And it kind of stinks. I don't remember. <laughs> This is like a very Flash Isaac-y run. Just a lot of... A lot of good items. And, you know, we didn't even really have to... There was no piloting involved. This run has been on autopilot. And people always suggest the autopilot. It's always a bad thing. He's running on autopilot. Yo! The metaphor makes no sense. Autopilot is more reliable than human piloting. Man, it just... It's very sad how he lives his life on autopilot. Oh, you mean how he lives his life using a series of tools invented by smarter individuals that statistically is much, you know, safer and more comfortable? Yeah, but without the risk of 
catastrophic failure. What's the fun? Anyway, I'm getting a little bit overly pedantic, which is not atypical for me. Help, 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 thank you. Also, I watched a little bit of Chopped Jr. this weekend. You know, I don't I don't like watching that many food shows anymore. I went through a phase, like I'm sure a lot of people do, where I was like, oh, Chopped, Cutthroat Kitchen is the greatest shows on TV, Iron Chef. Look, I don't dislike them, but I just kind of overloaded on them. But I was like, you know, Chopped with 13-year-old kids, this could be fun. But then, I'm telling you, the judges are pulling their punches. And that's fine, you know, they're kids. They're Zoomers, they're fragile. Hey, Zoomers, by the way, get used to it. The older generation punching down. And also the younger generation punching down. Zoomers are always calling me a boomer. Hey, I paid my rent on time. Shut up, boomer. We're going to save the planet. All right, well. It's quite admirable, actually. Um, they're pulling their punches. When they, when they have the adults on Chopped, the adults are like, you know, hey chef, I've made for you a, a manchego dusted wild boar loin uh, with a, a beautiful sweet corn polenta. And then they take like one bite and they go, I don't really know what you were thinking with this dish, dummy. This is stupid. The manchego is, is too uh, bitter, doesn't go with the boar at all. Should have paired it with a different starch. The polenta's overpowering. And then they just go like, thank you, chef. The kids are like, hey, I, I don't know. I put a chicken nugget in the microwave and put a little dollop of Dijon mustard on it. And they're like, wow, a very interesting... A, a Western-style chicken tonkatsu. I haven't seen this kind of ingenuity in my entire life. You're some kind of... And I'm like, dude, I got a controversial opinion for you, okay? As, uh, I, I think they got it reversed. As an adult, I think I'm way more like, I don't want to say emotionally fragile, because I got some resilience. But I'm like a little, I'm a little bit more, uh, I take criticism to heart more than I did when I was a kid, I think, you know? When I was a kid, if the, you know, I got a, well, that's not true, necessarily. I was going to say if I got like a bad mark on a project or something, I got over it, but, I mean, I did get over it. But it took a couple of years. But I think, like, I could deal with feedback a little bit better. Now, as an adult, I'm like, dude, I spend all day working. You know, I, I do... I have domestic duties after that. You know, you finish working, you do the dishes. You vacuum. You feed the cats. You groom the cats. You pay your bills. You have a phone call with the man who works in a glass building. He wears a suit to work, and he tells you... You know, hey, you should uh, do this, do this, and this. And you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then, uh, you know, I think after a long day of that, if Padma Lakshmi was like, you know, I don't really like your uh, booyah base, I would be in shambles. I'd be in tears. I'm working so hard for nothing. As a kid, you know, you got a little bit most of the time. You know, you got a little bit more of a carefree existence. You go to school, you know, eight hours a day, but then, like, you know, two hours of it is lunch plus recess, and you have, like, you know, art class, which isn't really that taxing. Don't shoot the messenger. And then when you get home, you're like, ugh, nobody has a life on Earth as hard as mine. Going to Thomas Jefferson Middle School, getting straight A's with minimal effort. Nobody knows what it's like to be me. Those are the kind of people in a position of their life where they could take some criticism. Plus, they're young. So if you give them that harsh criticism early, they have more time in their lives to enact it. It's too late for me. My bouillabaisse recipe is not changing. I've changed to fit the bouillabaisse recipe. Are you really advocating for being meaner to kids? Well, yes and no. I'm not really advocating for it, but that is what I'm... Those are the words coming out of my mouth. But they're coming out of my mouth, ironically. Sort of. I don't think we should be ruder to kids. I, I think that's ridiculous. However, take it from somebody who, uh, you know, as far as I can tell, 
I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know anybody who is the parent of like a 12 year old child right now. So I can't, speaking, you know, the difference between, you know, generations. I can only speak for like my generation and then, you know, people who are, uh, you know, maybe like five or six right now. Because that's basically my sister-in-law's kids. But um, I think my generation was way more coddled than we should have been. And this is why I hate to say it, fellow millennials, because that's not to say we've had an easy life. Is you know, generationally speaking, we've been caught in this, you know, basically like a permanent economic crunch uh, caused by the previous generation, generations, I guess. And then whenever we we're like, hey, the economic system's messed up because you guys screwed it up, and they're like, did we screw it up or did you screw it up? And we're like, we I was like 19 when the recession happened, and they're like, exactly. Anyway, I was gonna go further. But we finished the run. We'll continue it next episode. Suffice it to say, I think I could have been pushed harder as a child. And when I look at, you know, my nieces, they're, I, I, some people might be like, they're doing too much. They're, you know, they're in school. They got a little language academy on the side, you know. Then they got, uh, you know, gymnastics on top of that. You know, they're working pretty hard. But I'm also like, they're kids. It's fun and they enjoy it. When I was like 12, and my parents raised me pretty well. I want like I I would give it like a 9.9 .9 out of 10. The point one is that sometimes, you know, my mom would be like, you know, you're at the age where you should really do some more chores, and I'd be like, that's true, but I'm also at the age where I'm getting straight A's. So do you really want to throw a monkey wrench into that equilibrium? And she should have been like, how about you just play? 25 minutes less Halo 2 every day and you clean your room dummy that would have that would have worked I would have been mad at the time, but it would have long term could have saved me a little grief Anyway for now. Thanks for watching. Hope you guys have enjoyed the episode If you did click the like button, I'm a great deal of course subscribe if you want to see more in the future for now Thanks for watching. I will see you next time. See ya